Hey pals, I'm here today to talk about the seven books I read in the month of August. I didn't read a lot in August, for two reasons really. I DNF'd a lot, so I guess I read a lot more pages than I'm going to talk about in this video, but they ended up being books I gave up on. I do talk about the books I gave up on, DNF'd, every month over on my Patreon, so that's always linked below in case you're interested. And I do really enjoy talking about the books I DNF'd, um, but I find it like sort of safer to do that, not like super publicly because you know sometimes also I feel bad um talking about like newer authors books if I didn't enjoy them so I do that over there but as well as like giving up on a lot of books I also just didn't feel like reading a lot this month because it's been really hot in England and I do not cope well on a normal summer um let alone this type of summer and it just puts me off um, reading or like being able to properly relax so I haven't read loads I'm hoping that will change in this last part of the year and I will get back into like reading lots and lots so let's talk about the books I did read the first one I read is The Perfect Golden Circle by Benjamin Myers this is a book that I put on my summer TBR because it is set in the summer of 1989 and I figured it'd be nice to read a summery book in the summer and it was I read this all sitting outside in the garden which was quite nice I was a bit disappointed in this I um, bought this book as soon as it came out because I had listened to The Offing by Benjamin Myers a couple of months ago and loved it. One of the best books I've read this year. And this is the author's newest book. The premise of this is you're following these two men who are sort of disconnected from society and live very solitary lives for different reasons. One of them is sort of like an off the grid hippie type character and the other is a um, war veteran who seems to be suffering with pretty severe PTSD and so um, they sort of connect through creating these crop circles and so each chapter is them going out to a field in the like depths of the night and making this crop circle and then in between each chapter you read like newspaper articles about these crop circles as they gain more and more fame and the crop circles they're making are like insane they are not like simple crop circles they're like absolutely brilliant and this book is beautifully written like Benjamin Myers is like one of the best like contemporary authors I've read in terms of nature writing the descriptions of the landscape and um, particularly at night are really beautifully done and um, the descriptions of how they create these crop circles um, and the animals they see are beautiful and um, so I really loved all of that but what I will say is I think I was perhaps a bit disappointed in the characters I was going to say the plot but I actually don't think I mean this is fairly plotless and I actually don't think I had an issue with that I think it's more that because the characters didn't really stand out to me and um, there wasn't like characters to carry a sort of plotless novel so what I mean by that is a lot of this book is um, their conversations and they have a lot of deep conversations about like their thoughts on life and philosophy politics capitalism and at a certain point, I just felt like I understand these two guys' perspectives. I know exactly what their thoughts are going to be on these things. I don't really need to hear it again. And they don't really feel like they're saying anything that's particularly um, new or like fresh. So having a whole novel about like their thoughts just felt a little bit pointless. It, it felt to me a little bit like Benjamin Myers wanted to get... Um, like some of his opinions down on paper and out there in the world and like these two characters were used to do that so yeah I didn't love this book I'd give it like three stars I think because the writing style is beautiful but yeah like towards the end I was sort of reading it to finish it and I wasn't really expecting anything super exciting to happen and it didn't so <laughs> there is that one um, but the next book is one I've had for years so I'm glad I finally read it and that is Girl Trouble by Holly Goddard Jones this is a short story collection and this is um, quite a long form short story collection because I think there's eight stories and some of them are like 60 pages long, which is quite unusual for short stories, um, particularly like a lot of the more popular collections. And I feel like this collection deserves a lot more um, buzz than it's received. It's got really um, not very many reviews on Goodreads. And I think one of the reasons for that is this is a very depressing, bleak book, okay? Like this book has like all the triggers it has loads of really difficult topics the stories are hard to read I read the first story in this collection back in December and didn't pick up until August even though I thought that story was really impressive and this took me all month to read for the same reason I'd finish a story be like that was so impressive but also really fucking depressing and do I want to read another one so 
I think if you've got the stomach for it, this is very, very good. And this is one that I did at about five stars because I felt like there's not really anything I can knock about her writing style. She entirely inhabits these characters. Yes, tonally, these stories are all similar. Um, the characters are all living quite difficult lives, uh, struggling with poverty and abuse. And there's just this pervading sense of hopelessness, but they do all still feel quite distinct. But yeah, I felt like I just couldn't give it five stars because for me, a five star book is a book that I want to go back to and I struggled with that. So just to give you a heads up on like some of the themes in this, like one of the stories is about, is from the perspective of a high school teacher who has been um, having sex with one of his students and she is pregnant and it's from his perspective and obviously he's awful. So hearing it from his perspective is not pleasant. There's also two connected stories which are probably the most difficult to read stories in the collection, which are about a... One is from the perspective of a mother, from a mother whose daughter was um, killed, but they think before she was killed, she was sexually assaulted. And one is from the perspective of one of the young men who um, was accused of sexually assaulting and killing her. And they're really hard stories to read. A lot of the stories deal with um, abuse of different types, and neglect, things like that. So yeah. Um, this is one I struggle to recommend because I think loads of people are going to be turned off by the content. But if you are okay with reading stories like that, I will say that her writing style is like brilliant. Um, these sort of topics I think can really veer towards um, melodrama um, and cliche and I never felt that. I felt that all of these characters truly felt like real people um, and yeah, it, it just never veered like too far one way. So I would recommend this and that I think um, it's like a success but I'd struggle to recommend it in terms of the content. Then I read my first Guy Gavriel K book and that is a song for, I don't know if you say it, Arbonne or Arbonne, not sure. I loved the first third of this book, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. This is, um, so Guy Gavriel K writes fantasy books that don't have a lot of fantasy in that are always based on like a real um, country and like period in history and this is based on um, like medieval France and we are um, seeing these sort of two different countries one being Arbonne, Arbonne which is a country that is ruled by women and women are very much admired and respected um, and these troubadours um, travel around and write stories and songs about the women and that's a massive part of their culture. And we're reading the story predominantly from the perspective of Blaze, who is from a more northern country, which is incredibly patriarchal, um, and they treat women awfully, and women are really, like, horrendously oppressed. And we're predominantly following him, but we also follow a few other characters. And, yeah, I don't really want to explain what the plot is, but there is, like, you know, quite a lot of plot to this. A lot of political intrigue, let's put it that way. First third, absolutely in love. Like, felt like... This was like going to be one of my favourites of the year. Beautifully written, really descriptive, loads of descriptions of the weather and the landscape, people's clothes. Um, I love scenes in fantasy novels where people are in like a tavern or a pub and there was quite a few of those so I was super happy. Um, there is a female character who's getting a perspective and I was like really enjoying that. Um, you know that's something you don't get a lot from fantasy books particularly when they're written by men and so I was really enjoying all that and then this book is split into seasons and I think it was the third season, um, a lot more plot happened and I felt like we sort of started losing those moments of like quiet um, comfort. And then I also felt towards the end that um, the woman's perspective we were getting sort of fell by the wayside and didn't really um, come to much. Um, and a complaint I had about this book was our main character who we're supposed to really like, and you know, you do really like him, makes quite a lot of comments about gay men and you're supposed to feel that he is from this awful patriarchal country and um, where they're very homophobic um, and he's just sort of parroting those beliefs but I just felt like you could remove those from the novel and, and everything else would still stand but it wouldn't have these horrible homopho homophobic bits in them so yeah um, I sort of wish that just wasn't in there. Um, so this ended up probably being like a three and a half star read, which I was gutted about because I really loved the start. Um, overall, I still look back on my reading of it with really fond memories and I did still really enjoy it and will definitely pick up some more of his books. But yeah, I just felt like 
the last third got a lot more like plot focused and some of the characters I was really interested in um, just didn't get as much space as I wanted them to. I actually read this next one on the last day of the month but I am just talking about the ones I have physically first and then I'll talk about the other ones. Um, so this book is The Waiting. This is by Kim Suk Jendry Kim and this is translated from the Korean by Janet Hong. This is the author's second graphic non-fiction book that's been translated into English, the first one being Grass. Um, and this one, this is interesting, okay, because this reads like, like I said, like, like non-fiction in that it's from the perspective of an author called Kim Suk Jendry Kim, and she's telling you that she writes um, graphic non-fiction, and she is telling you about her mother's story in that her mother was North Korean, but during the conflict, her mother fled and was separated from her husband and son. And um, this may be something you're aware of, but um, you can apply to be part of like a lottery um, if you're in North and South Korea to meet your family. And once a year, uh, about 100 people, I think, get selected and they get to meet their family member at the border who they haven't seen in like decades but, um, since the... Um, countries were separated into two and her mother has applied years ago and every year hopes that she will um, be contacted so she can see her son who she hasn't seen since he's like two years old um, and the author then tells you the story of her mother um, as well as like the present day story of like what it's like for women of her mother's age or for people of her mother's age to to have to live with the fact that they may never see their siblings, their, their partners, their children ever again and how devastating that must be and that you can't even see them, talk to them on a phone call or anything. So I thought this was really well done. Um, you know, it's hard to say you enjoy a book like this because it's obviously about a really difficult topic. Um, I enjoyed the art style. A lot of it is you're quite typical, you know, all these different smaller boxes with the scene. Um, but some would be like this, where like this is her mother as an older woman um, relaying the story of her childhood and she's sort of like moving the pieces on the board um so I really liked the art style I thought it really worked for the narrative and yeah like it was really eye-opening to hear about these stories but what I will say and this is not a critique this was just something I found like an interesting decision at the end there is an author's letter where the author says actually this is not my mother's story she spoke to her mother and two other older women and she blended their three stories together because even today it's dangerous to write your actual story because um, the authorities could um, you know contact you about it and not be happy about the fact that you've you've revealed this about what happened in North Korea at the time and so to protect everybody she um, blended these three women's stories together so they're sort of unrecognizable but I just sort of wish that I'd been put at the start because there was a couple of points where I was a bit confused. Like she'd mentioned that she had um, three siblings and then later on she'd say that her mother raised eight children and I'd be like a bit confused. And I think that happens because so at some point she's referencing the fictionalised account and at some point she's referencing the real account. Um, and that was just a little bit confusing for me. I'd sort of flick back and be like, oh, did I misunderstand? So, so I just think I would rather have known that going in because then I would have just understood um, that there were certain things that weren't necessarily going to add up. But um, yeah, I would highly recommend this. I um, think she's a really great graphic, um, you know, not novelist because this is non-fiction. She's very good at this and I would read whatever she brings out in the future and I gave this four stars. Then I have two audiobooks and one novel which I've taken back to the library. First audiobook is My Policeman by Beth and Roberts. Quite a few people recommended this to me in my sort of summer TBR video. And I wasn't intending to get to it, but I DNF quite a few books already on my summer TBR, so I thought, oh, I'll replace it with um, another one. And I checked, and this has two different audio narrators, a man and a woman, and it's really well done. So I was like, I'm going to give this one a go. This is a difficult one to talk about because this is... Um, it, has two narratives it has a framing device it opens in i think the 90s and um this woman is living in a house with her husband and she is saying that his um, lover from many years ago um, has recently had a stroke and she has located him and brought him to their home and she's sort of trying to um, care for him and the narrative you're reading from the past is her writing a letter to this man, Patrick, 
um, who is her husband's lover from many years ago, telling him um, the story from her perspective. So we go all the way back to her being a young girl and how she meets her husband, Tom, um, how she doesn't realise he's gay um, and marries him and then like comes across Patrick and, and all that sort of entanglement. And then you also get Patrick's, Patrick's perspective, which is from diary entries he wrote in the 1950s when he met Tom. Um, and, and Tom was a policeman, hence the title, My Policeman. And you're sort of building towards trying to figure out why um, the married couple haven't spoken to Patrick for like 40 years. Um, and yeah, so that's the sort of framing device. Now, I thought this was a brilliantly written historical fiction novel. I do wonder whether I enjoyed this a bit more because the two audiobook narrators were brilliant. That might have helped. But yeah, I felt like there was a real sense of place. I really like her level of description. I could really picture everything. Um, I could really sympathise with um, the characters. I found Tom pretty um, unlikable, uh, a pretty selfish person, but I um, yeah, really sympathised with our two um, protagonists. But really big issues with the representation of the lives of gay men during this period. Now, I don't want to spoil anything, but what I will say is when the book opens, we're led to believe that Patrick had had this stroke and was like lying alone in a hospital with no one to care for him until, I think she's called Marion, until she finds him. And yeah, I'm just not sure how, like, and then when you understand like what actually happened, I just don't know how well it sits with me. It feels like that sort of really depressing, hopeless story we're always given about queer people in that time period, remembering that the framing narrative is in the 90s. So like things are like, obviously have a long way to go still, but are way better than they were in the 50s. Um, and I just didn't find the like gap we were given that believable in terms of where Patrick's life would have ended up, or in fact, where Tom and Marion's would. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed the historical story, but when you pair that with the framing narrative, um, I found it frustrating that this is the story we're given about queer people. So yeah, didn't rate this one because I don't really know where I sit in terms of um, my feelings with it. Then I listened to Takeaway Stories from a Childhood Behind the Counter by Angela Hoy. This is a memoir and I enjoyed this. Um, so basically the author's a similar age to me. I think she was born in the early 90s and her parents were from China and they opened a Chinese takeaway in a small town in Wales in the, I think in the 80s. And she is raised um, in the same building as this takeaway and it is about um, yeah, what it was like for her growing up as a child um, who works in a Chinese takeaway. And she does work. Like, this book, she starts to sort of tell it from the perspective of when she's around 11. And, yeah, like, she'll, she, wor <laughs> she works, like, every evening in the takeaway. It's a very interesting look at, um, yeah, how much her parents expected from her and her brothers in terms of how much work they had to put into the takeaway. Um, obviously, it's a really interesting discussion about um, racism and the fact that Chinese takeaways at the time were a very new thing in the UK and like super super popular and um, the fact that obviously we know now that the dishes we're served in a Chinese takeaway are not the dishes that Chinese people would actually eat um, and are actually very like um, fatty and unhealthy compared to what um, these families would eat separate to what they put on the takeaway menu. So I really enjoyed this. Her parents have a very difficult relationship. Her father's a very difficult man. I thought all that was handled um, really well. Um, this felt super nostalgic. You know, I'm a similar age to her. Um, I remember going as a child to the Chinese takeaway and like waiting for my order. So all the sort of, um, her descriptions of um, what the Chinese takeaway would have looked like um, were very nostalgic for me. Obviously as one of those white customers she's describing, she talks um, about the racism they injured and the abuse they had to put up with and how difficult it was for her parents. And I, I thought all of that was really interesting. I think the writing style serves a purpose. Um, it tells her story, um, but it's not like anything particularly special. Like I found her story interesting. I probably wouldn't pick up something she wrote in the future because I think the writing wasn't anything special. I also think the one thing I wish she would spoken about more was the fact that she she speaks about the fact that her parents rely on her so much. Um, she doesn't speak Mandarin well enough to really be able to have a brilliant relationship with them and they don't speak English well enough to be able to have a brilliant relationship with her. But her and her brothers have to handle like all the bills and everything from a young age because of the language barrier. 
So she's very open about how much pressure is put on her because of the Chinese takeaway, but she doesn't really confront how she had to work a lot of hours at a very young age um, and how like late she had to stay up to do that. I thought that would have been a really interesting thing to talk a bit more about um, and I felt like that was a missed opportunity. Um, but yeah, I enjoy this. I think it's well narrated. I'd recommend um, you pick it up on audio. And I think if you are British and you like are around the same age as the author and you know have that sort of um, understanding of what a big thing Chinese takeaways were, um, you know, pretty much every row of shops would have a chip shop and a Chinese takeaway, then I think this is an interesting memoir to listen to. And the last book I'm going to talk about is True Biz by Sarah Novick. I've since returned this to the library, um, but I really enjoyed this one. I had sort of mixed feelings, okay? The first like 140 pages, I was in love with this book. It was like a five star read. I was enjoying everything about it. The premise is the first chapter you open at a um, boarding school that's specifically for deaf students. And the headmistress has realised that three of her students have disappeared. And the police have arrived and they're trying to find where these students are because I think they're only around 16. And she's like, oh my God, like, what the hell? And then you go back um, six months and you start to meet these students. And the story is told from two of the students' perspectives and also the headmistress's perspective. And they're all giving you this sort of different, um, I guess, insight into the deaf community. The headmistress is um, a hearing child of deaf adults. The um, perspective, who I guess is like our main protagonist, Charlie, has had a really difficult upbringing in terms of um, her deafness because her mother um, chose for her to have a cochlear implant inserted when she was like three. It's never really worked. Charlie can only um, distinguish about 60% of um, like conversations around her because of that she's really struggling at school and also the implant causes her a lot of pain and like headaches. Her parents have got a divorce and her father has won custody and he's decided to enrol her at this boarding school for deaf children. And so everything's changing. She suddenly got all this access to language. She's learning to sign and she like feels really happy about it. Um, but she's still having this difficult relationship where she's still obviously a minor and her parents still get to make decisions about her to do with her, her hearing and and she doesn't agree necessarily with them. And then we're also told the perspective from a young boy at the school who is like her mentor, her buddy, he's showing her around and he comes from a long line of deaf family members who are sort of famous in the community and he is quite unique in that he comes from a really loving, caring, safe family where he's never been made to feel less than for his deafness. He's never been excluded because of it. And that is not the case for a lot of the students. So I loved the first 140 pages. I loved the like school vibes. It reminded me that I want to read way more books that take place um, in like educational settings and um, particularly like this sort of boarding school. Um, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, I just loved her writing style. I thought all of her descriptions were great. Um, I liked the way we were introduced to all the characters. So everything about that was great. Um, but in particular, in regards to the, the plot and the themes, I just found it all really interesting. And I felt initially, as a non-owned voices reader, um, that we were being given a really good level of um, information about the deaf community and deaf culture without it feeling like the author was simplifying it for somebody who was like completely new to the topic. So I was really enjoying it. Now, obviously, I'm not an own voices reviewer, so um, I can't say how an own voices um, reviewer would feel about that. But as I got further into the narrative, um, I had a couple of issues with it. I started to feel that maybe the author was simplifying it for um, somebody who was new to the topic. And the reason I felt that way was because there was two characters who randomly got chapters from their perspective. And it was literally just so that something could be like over explained to us a little bit. And I just didn't think those chapters were necessary. Um, it literally felt just like the author was like, hey, I want you to know this fact about deaf history. So I'm going to get this character to tell you it. So people started to feel a little bit like um, less of a real person and more as like a spokesperson for something the author wanted to relay. And I also felt like the second half of the novel gets a lot more plotty and I don't want to spoil any of that plot. Um, but I just preferred it when it was less plotty and more like examining. I found Charlie's relationship with her parents fascinating. I found the fact that she was a minor and they could make the decisions about um, her health just awful. 
Um, and I thought all of those discussions were really interesting. The dynamics of when she would like spend Thanksgiving with, with her mother and how that would go down um, was really interesting. And I just felt like the end felt like perhaps a bit rushed and um, the characters started to feel like not as fleshed out as I first thought they, they were going to be at the start of the novel. So I would really recommend this. There's so much to praise about it. Um, I found it deeply interesting and I want to read way more books um, about um, deaf culture and deaf history because of it, both fiction and non-fiction. But yeah, I just felt that um, the first chunk was, was much stronger than the end. And this was an interesting one for me because it really made me examine. So my maternal grandmother um, is deaf and she was not born deaf. She um, had a sort of medical complications when she had one of her children and um, a sort of failing um, of medicine at the time caused her to slowly lose her hearing over many years. And she's like, I think um, like 90% deaf. She could hear like really loud music. And my nanny could lip read and I'd always assumed that she was um, given sort of training in how to lip read. And when I read this book, I was thinking, you know, why was she never taught to sign? Why were none of her children and her grandchildren taught to sign? So I was speaking to my mum about this and she was saying that my nanny was never taught to lip read. And um, when she started to lose her hearing, they just sort of said, you know, um, just sort of get on with it, really. Um, and a big thing in this novel is that a lot of these children are not taught to sign because their parents do not want to accept that their children are deaf. They want their children to work harder to appear hearing, to not embarrass them. And, and I think a lot of... Um, guidance at the time that my nanny would have been given by and the medical community would have been very much the same. So yeah, this book was um, really eye-opening and made me consider a lot of the biases that would have really shaped um, the life my nanny has had um, because of this. So yeah, I, I would really recommend it and I definitely want to read more about, um, like I said, deaf history and deaf culture, so feel free to recommend me more books. And yeah, I'd love to know if you've read any of the books I spoke about, um, what you read and enjoyed in the month. And yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.